My name is Jay. I'm the Minister of Outreach, and just my joy to bring you um, God's Word this morning as we talk about being a mission-minded church, and as you, a part of the church, a, mi- a mission-minded believer in Jesus Christ. So that's where we want to go to today. And so today I want to look at a biblical model of the mission-minded church. Now, often when we talk about missions, we think of the Great Commission where Jesus said to go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations. We think of Acts 1, 8, where Jesus told his disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Samaria and to um, the rest of the remote parts of the world. And outside of these verses, we really don't see commands on what it means to be mission-minded. And I think that's because the church just did it. They didn't have commands to do it. They just did it. They just lived it out. So to be mission-minded, we don't go looking for these commands in Scripture, but rather we just look at what the early church did and then copy that. Well, we see the first in the, this first century church is that they were mission-minded, and the entire church... Okay, hear me, hear me say that. The entire church was involved in missional activities. Now, it's easy to throw around these churchy words, and you might be new to church. You haven't heard these things of being missional or mission-minded, so let's make sure we're all working from the same definitions. Missional here is used, as I use it today, as we talk about this today, missional is both the church and the people in the church. Missional churches and missional Christians both recognize that God is a sending God. He sent his son into the world, and now he sends his church into the world. We send missionaries, but we also recognize that as believers in Christ, we too are missionaries who are sent out into our own worlds. As a church, we are missional in sending out missionaries, but equally as important as believers in Christ We are missionaries sent out into our neighborhoods, our workplaces, and our schools. And as our culture becomes more and more postmodern, this becomes even more and more important. In the West, we have historically built churches to attract our culture to the church. We call this the attractional model of church planting. Today, however, this is not as effective, and the church has less and less attraction to our postmodern culture. Therefore, we must be missional in going out into our communities, out into our cultures, and represent Christ and his word. When we do this, we are missional, and we join with God on his mission to restore and heal his creation and call his people into a reconciled relationship with himself. I was reading and studying for this passage, uh, this point today. Listen to what this one author said about this idea of being missional as our church and as individuals. He says, many times we wrongly assume that the primary activity of God is in the church rather than recognizing that God's primary activity is in the world and the church is God's instrument sent into the world to participate in his redemptive mission. The key distinction, and I want you to hear this this morning, the key distinction clarifies the difference between a church with a missions program and a church that is a missional church. A church with a missions program usually sees missions as one activity alongside many other equally important programs of the church. A missional church, on the other hand, focuses all of its activities around its participation in God's agenda for the world. God's mission must form and inform everything that we do. All activities of the church must be catalyzed by and organized around this mission of God, end quote. So three things I want you to learn today, hear from me today, and take away from the scriptures today. One is that missions is a church-wide ministry. Everyone is called to be involved in missions. Secondly, participating in short-term global outreach trips is a means of participating in missions, but not an exclusive means. That is, you can be involved in missions without going on a short-term global outreach trip. 
And thirdly, we have this special Sunday not to highlight our missions program, but to remind us of the call that we all have to be on mission and to be missional. Now, this is a change from what we have suggested or communicated in the past on Global Outreach Sundays. And because of this difference, the Global Outreach Sunday today will look a little bit different probably than it has for those of you that have been here in the past. First of all, we're not rolling out our global outreach trips as we've done in the past. Instead, what we're doing is we're introducing you to our global outreach partners. Or I call them partners or our missionaries. It might be a more common term, um, but more on that as we go along. Secondly, you hear, see this new language that Keith talked about in this word, glocal. As Keith mentioned, this is a combination <clears throat> of global and local and also, if I get fired for this idea, we can just change the letters, just put a B up there, and we'll get back to global, I guess. I don't know. So it was an inexpensive way to change it. So, but there's two areas of ministry that we are combining here that we want to emphasize. We've combined them, linguistically at least, to emphasize the fact that we are all on mission to the world, and it is the world that's far away, but also the world that is right here near us. Glocal emphasizes and serves to remind us that the world out there more and more is the world that is right here. What this means is that to be a global Christian, you don't even have to travel far distances. In fact, it's often the case that you can share the gospel with someone in another culture just by going across your yard or going across your street or going across your classroom or going across the hall at your workplace. The world has come to us. We are to be mobile. We are to be global Christians right where, we're, right where we live. So with all this as an introduction, let's take a look at the missional model of the first century church. <clears throat> and as we do, I think you will see five characteristics of the mission-minded church that we want to emulate here to ensure that we are missionally, missional individually as well as corporately. So these five characteristics of a mission-minded church are the mission-minded church sends out missionaries, the mission-minded church supports missionaries, the mission-minded church reaches other cultures, the mission-minded church builds uh, relational bridges with missionaries, and finally the mission-minded church is blessed because of their involvement in missions. Well, it's, you'll stand together uh, with me in honor of reading God's word. This is our tradition here. We're going to read from Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, just a short passage, because we're going to be in a lot of passages today. By the way, my brain works in New American Standard 1995 version, so that's what you're going to get. Hey, it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. <laughs> All right, reading of God's Word, Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Now there were at Antioch. In the church that was there, prophets and teachers, you're going to get a lot of names in a lot of cities today, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they had reached Salamis, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you for standing in honor of his word. The first characteristic of a mission-minded church is found in this Acts 13 passage, the mission-minded church sends out missionaries. Three things to note here uh, quickly about uh, this sending activity. First of all, missions is part of the ministry of the church. Verse 2, he says, while they were ministering and fasting. Missions was not some special program that the church came up with separate from the other ministries that they were doing. It was God's idea that he gave to the church while they were leading the church. Missions, again, is God's desire for the whole church, and it's part of their regular ministry. 
Secondly, missions is covered by prayer and fasting from start to finish. So we see this here. The church was praying and fasting when they were told to send Paul and Barnabas in verse 2. And then they prayed and fasted again when they sent them out in verse 3. And this not only teaches us the significance and the importance of missions, but again, it also ties it together as part of the entire mission and the entire ministry of the church. It wasn't something separate. Thirdly, when the mission-minded church sends missionaries, they send their best. We see in verse 1, the five leaders of the church that were there, and of these they sent Paul and uh, they sent Barnabas. You know, sometimes we have people in our churches that we love and, and we want to hold on to them. And like, well, these are special people. And there, there were probably some people that were, you know, hey, hey God, you know, hey, Holy Spirit, you know, Cyrene's a good guy. Can't we send him? But God said, no, I want these two. We have to be ready to send our best. When God calls them to the mission field. The second characteristic of mission-minded church is that the mission-minded church supports missionaries. We're going to look at a couple ways that we support missionaries. First, we support missionaries financially. Keith already talked about this by giving, you know, when you give, right, we, we call you to tithe. We want to, as a church, be an example of that. So we tithe what you tithe, right? So 10% of what you give comes out of that gift, 7% goes to global outreach and 3% goes to our church planting efforts. Okay, so when you give, 7% of that is going to support our missionaries. And we support 19 missionaries um, currently, and we're always looking for more, and we keep adding them as we go. But Paul noted this in his church to Philippi. and He said this, You have done well to share with me in my affliction, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. He tells the same thing to the church at Rome. Uh, and he says that, you know, that they had, he hopes to be helped by them along the way. Um, so many people, again, were, were supported and they were encouraged um, by their giving. And like he said, I just want to encourage you, you know, not only do your regular giving here, that knowing, knowing that that is going to support missionaries, but what, this is one of the ways you partner with, with our uh, missionaries and with our ministry partners is that you can give. You know, Keith mentioned he and Barry do that. Janet and I do this, where we're giving above and beyond our giving to the church goes to support those that are on the field and doing this work. And we see over and over and over how God calls us to that, but also, as we'll see here in a minute, the blessings that come from that. So the mission-minded church supports with finances, but also the mission-minded church supports our, minis- our missionaries with prayer, and always covering them with prayer. And this was Paul's regular request to the churches that sent him. And I know it's a regular request that we receive from our partners as well. Paul said this to the church at Ephesus. He said, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. He told pretty much the same thing to the church at Colossae, to the church at uh, Thessalonica. He simply gave the command, brethren, pray for us. And again, I can tell you story after story of being on the mission field or getting reports back from our missionaries that are on the mission field, the importance and their reliance on prayer. I think it's so easy, I think especially in the West, maybe I'm speaking for myself, maybe you guys don't have this problem, of just relying on self. And there's so many resources that we have, and we say, well, we can figure it out, and then I get to the end of my rope, and then I go to pray. Well, when you're on the mission field, a lot of times you don't have a rope to be the end of. (laughs) And it's so encouraging to see them just stop and pray, and then the blessing of seeing God answer those prayers. And I think of how many times I rob myself of that blessing because I don't go to God, I go to my rope. And it's such a blessing to see them. And, you know, like last week, I was with one of our missionary families in uh, Kansas City and just being able to sit and to pray with them and what a blessing that was to have them pray with me and and to pray for me as well as 
praying with them for their needs as well. Such a, such a blessing, such an honor to be praying with them. And you can do the same. You know, I just encourage you to get on the, the newsletter list and the prayer list of one, of one of our partners. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that today. And just get their prayer requests and just pray with them and pray for them and know that that blesses them. Um, and it just keeps you engaged in their culture and the things that they are doing as well. Thirdly, the mission-minded church reaches out to other cultures. And again, they do this in two ways. Sending out globally to reach other cultures, but also by reaching other cultures living within their own cultural context. So look at these one at a time. First, they, there's this sending of missionaries out of the culture into other cultures. This is what we saw and that was going on in Acts chapter 13 that we read this morning earlier with Paul and Barnabas. Paul and Barnabas go to the island of Patmos, which is a Greek island that is under Roman rule. And remember, this has been Paul's ministry and practice from the beginning of his ministry. Paul, the, the Jew of Jews, he says, is reaching out to a completely different culture of Gentiles. And he talks about this when he, he in a letter he writes to the, to the Galatian churches where he says, you know, Peter had the ministry to Jews, and in the same way, God has given me a ministry to the Gentiles. And in fact, he talks about how the church at Jerusalem sent him back to the church at Antioch. Okay, that's where he was in Acts chapter 13. He sent him back to that church at Antioch, and it's then that church at Antioch that sends him out to to go to Patmos, and then they, other churches will send him, and other churches send him, and he gets this practice over and over and over again that we see in the New Testament. And that is the mission-minded church that says, we're going to go out and we're going to reach these other cultures, and we're going to help those cultures reach their culture and other cultures as well. Yes. And we get to play a part in that. We, we support Subash in southern India, and guess what he does? He plants churches all over South Asia. You're a part of that. But you can be more a part of that if you partner with him and hear what he's doing and pray for him and support him in that work that he's doing. That's how we get to be missional. We have these missional partners that we partner with. And this is the model of sending. It's releasing our best to go. You go out into the world to share the gospel with other cultures, many of whom never have the opportunity to hear of Jesus Christ. And we've been so blessed to send people from our own body, our own congregation. And then we've, been, we've just been so blessed to partner with others as well. And then we've been, you know, we're blessed to then go and partner with them, right? So we have, a part, we have a group that just got back from Costa Rica this week down there supporting our partner down there. You know, we just, it's, it's just constantly, have, we have six to eight trips a year where we're going and we're supporting the work that they're already doing and helping them do the work that they couldn't do without the help that we come to bring them. But the mission-minded church is not limited to sending missionaries in order to reach other, in culture, other cultures. And this is so important for us to understand. Remember this word, glocal, okay, this is what reminds us of this. We are all missionaries, and in this sense, are all sent out. Okay? You are a missionary who has been sent out into your own culture. We go out into our communities, and that's the second way that the mission-minded church reaches other cultures. You, know, you can see the reality of this in this church at Antioch. Look back at that, at that verse. I knew I wasn't supposed to close my Bible. Look back at that first verse. Okay, listen to, listen to the description of the leaders in this church. Now, there were at Antioch and the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, he's from Cyprus, and Simeon, who was called Niger, he's from Africa, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. How did that church get to be so culturally diverse? Because they were reaching the culture that was diverse where they were. So there is this diverse culture, so the church looks what? Diverse. diverse. That only happens when we reach the diverse culture around us. That is what God is sending us out to. As this church, as this area, as the greater Austin area becomes more and more culturally diverse, our church should be more, more culturally diverse because we're sending out you 
to reach that culture. I cannot stress strongly enough the importance that this plays in proclaiming the gospel as a mission-minded church. There's so many similarities between first century Antioch and the greater Austin area today. Let me show you an illustration from scripture. It's a negative illustration, but I I think we can turn it positively and look at it positively. It's from Galatians chapter 2. Maybe a familiar story to you. But when Cephas, this is Peter, who was a Jew, when he came to Antioch, Paul says, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to coming of certain men from James, okay, James is from the church at Jerusalem, so he's bringing a group of Jews from the Jerusalem church. So for, for, uh, for prior to the coming of certain men from James, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles. But when the Jews came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision, that's the Jews. And the rest of the Jews joined him in his hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. Now listen to this next verse very carefully. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like Gentiles and not like Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Okay, go back to that sentence. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the gospel, what is Paul saying here? Paul is saying that Peter's lack of cultural sensitivity had an adverse effect on the gospel. But positively, the more we know about other cultures, the more more sensitive we are to cultural differences, and the clearer and more effective our gospel presentation, and the less likely we are to turn someone off to or against the gospel. So when we learn about other cultures, we more effectively reach other cultures. And this is why being missional personally is so important. And how do you get to know these other cultures? How do I know the cultures that I want to reach into? I grew up in North Texas, spent a bunch of time in California, got back as soon as I could. (laughs) But my experience has been around a bunch of other American people. I've been in Western culture all my life, saturated in it, right? So how am I supposed to reach these other cultures that I know nothing about. You know, I've read books on, on, on Islamic faith. I've been in some Islamic countries. But I'm telling you, I learned more about Islamic culture when I had a three-hour meal with an imam and his family, and we talked theology. I've learned more about the Islamic faith by being with our partners that reach into those communities. I don't know anything. I mean, I got to tell you, when I grew up in North Texas, we didn't have any Hindu temples. Sherman, Texas does not have Hindu temples. But I learned from being around those that swim in those waters. And when I swam in those waters with them, then I began to learn more about that culture and more about how to reach that culture with the gospel. We have people in this church We have people in this church that swim in those cultures that are here to teach you and to help you. We have partners that we partner with that are here to swim in that water with you and teach you and help you. Because I bet if you look around your neighborhood, if you look around your workplace, if you look around your school, you're going to see people that aren't from a culture like yours. And to effectively reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to be missional to understand that culture. Because things sometimes just don't translate. So when you learn them and you know them, I mean, I just just got a newsletter this week from one of our partners that was just full of cultural things about reaching people in their culture with the gospel. And you know what? They're halfway around the world, but there's three people in my neighborhood that I know of that are from that culture. So I can be missional here from what I learned from them because they swim in those waters. So how does this pertain to you? You just need to get with people and swim in those waters with them. Sign up to get those new layers. Sign up to partner with our partners. You're going to go out today. You're going to see all all these people out there that have 
have, are representing our partners. I'm sorry, it was really nice when we set it all up. <laughs> now it's cold. All of them have a QR code. Let me give you a little cheat code that I didn't give the first service. So congratulations for sleeping in. You're getting the cheat code. Okay? All of those QR codes go to the same thing. Okay? So don't, you don't have to go to which one, but just at least click on that. That'll take you to our, web, our website that has all of our global missionary partners on it. You can look through them. You can see what they're doing. Some of them have websites, and if they do, that information's on there, and you can click straight through to it. Otherwise, it just has a connect button, and you can click on that connect button, and a form comes up, and all of those are on there, and you can say, I want information on this person, I want information on this person, I want information on this person. That form comes to me, I get you connected, okay? Now, we have some people, because of security measures, can't be on the website, and it lists them there and what they're doing in, in, in the general area of the world where they are. If you want information about that, then I can get you that information at that. But find one that you're interested in. Either the area of the world they're in, the work they're doing. We have people church planting. We have anti-sex trafficking. We have, you know, working with local, you know, groups, local culture groups. Find something that says, you know what, I'd be interested in that. And then swim in the waters with them. Get connected, get connected, get connected. Fourthly, the mission-minded church builds relational bridges. Missions is not a one-way activity. It is one in which both the one sent and the one who receives is involved, blessed, and enriched. We build these bridges. Honestly, this is the most important characteristic of the mission-minded church. Without this characteristic, the church really will not be mission-minded. It might be involved in missions. It might even have a missions program. But if it is not building bridges, it is not characteristic of the first century mission-minded churches. Now, the reason I refer to this as a bridge is because like a bridge, the information goes back and forth. We give, but we receive. Too often in the Western church, especially, information only goes one way. The church sends the missionary funds to the missionary, sends people to tell the missionary how to do ministry, and on and on with little or no information or help coming back across the bridge. There's no better help for working with other cultures than to learn from someone who is in that culture. Yes, we are the Western church, but no, we don't know everything. <laughs> we have much to learn from our brothers and sisters who are serving in other cultures. Again, the first century church built these relational churches with one another. We see this over and over and over in Acts and in the epistles. You know, Acts, in Acts 15, uh, Paul says, After some days, Paul and Barnabas, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return to visit the brethren. Okay, let's go visit the people they're with. He doesn't say, Let's go visit the missions pastor. Let's go visit the missions committee. No, let's go visit all the brethren that we met with. Acts 18, having spent some time there, Paul left and passed successfully through the Galatian region and, and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Acts 16, 17, same thing. Stephanus and Fortuitus and Acacius, I told you we're going to get a lot of names today. They came on a short-term mission trip to visit Paul, right? So what do they do? They go back, share what Paul is doing Paul sends Tychicus, same thing, going back and forth. Going and reporting to the church, this is what's going on. We do that all the time here. We call them spotlights, right? That group that just went to Costa Rica and served with the Bribri, their next Sunday after church in the loft, they're going to have lunch. They're going to be talking about, hey, here's what we did. Here's what's going on at the nest. You want to know what's going on in the nest? You want to get involved with the nest and the work that they're doing with the Bribri women and children? Hey, that's a great place to go. Go to that lunch. It's a free lunch. You get to learn what's going on. It's always this bridge that's being built back and forth. John said this in 3 John. Okay, for those of you that always wanted to know what 3 John was in the Bible for, now you're going to know. All right. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you accomplish for the brethren, and especially when they are strangers, and they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God, 
For they went out for the sake of the name of Christ, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Here's the bridge. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that they may be fellow workers with the truth. Hey, what, what John's talking about here is there was a group that had come through that were missionaries and they came to the church that John's writing to and they supported them and they began to partner with them. And he's commending them for that partnership. If you continue to read in 3 John, you see where a church didn't do that and he condemns them for their not partnering with them. So in these... Uh, we begin to see now some of the, what is our fifth characteristic of the mission-minded church, and that is the mission-minded church is blessed because of their involvement with missions. For this, I ask your forgiveness because for years we've just done our go trips, and I think I've robbed you a little bit of these blessings. I want you to be blessed because of partnerships. There are rewards for financially supporting our missionaries. Paul talks about those, remember I reread from Philippians 4 uh, and the gifts that he sent to them. Here's how he described those in uh, Philippians 4.18. He, he describes those gifts as a fragrant aroma and acceptable sacrifice well-pleasing to God. When you partner with a missionary financially, that's what your gift is called before God, a fragrant aroma. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus told the disciples, he who receives a prophet, receives a prophet's reward. Man, I read that verse in 1 John, where he, or in 3 John, where he talks about receiving, and I think of Judy Gustafson. Bought a house right over here, got a house a lot, more, a lot bigger than what she needed because she wanted to be able to host missionaries when they came through town. And the way that she has hosted and opened her home, and so many of our missionaries have stayed there and been blessed there, and she's going to receive the reward of a prophet because she's received a prophet. You can do that too. Paul told the church at Rome, he said, whenever I go to Spain, I hope to see you in passing. We read this before. And he says, helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company. These are relational rewards. Listen to Acts chapter 20. This is Paul when he goes back through and he meets with the Ephesian elders. He says, when he had said these things, this Paul, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they began to weep loudly and embraced Paul. This is why I travel way too much. Because I can't just send somebody because I want to see these people. <laughs> I mean, believe me, you're welcome to go with me. I'd love for you to go with me. And we take a lot of people. But I go because of the relationships that are there. Yeah. You can go in my office. I got everything from hats and pictures to bones of sheep that people have given me. There's a reason for the bones of sheep. That people have given me that are just mementos of my relationships that I have with them. Those are just some of the benefits that you have from being missional. And from having these relationships with him. Everyone involved is blessed because they're a part of mission-minded churches. But let me warn you, the opposite of this is true as well. When you're not involved in missions, you rob yourself of so many blessings, rewards, and relationships. So you've seen a lot, I've talked a lot, we've gone through a lot here of what it's like to be a mission-minded church. I want you to hear from a couple of our partners what it's like for them to partner with us and with you. Okay, so watch this video. We are extremely grateful to see you. Um, see you with the second church that partnered with our ministry. And we couldn't be any, um, any happier. So part of the benefits that CDBU, um, the, the partnership with CDBU has brought to the nest is like, you know, as you can see, we actually were able to build a second house for our children. This house ha uh, could house up to eight kids. Uh, not only that, but there's one um, for Christmas, we have been able to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And not only celebrate the birth of Jesus, but we, every time we work with the children, we outreach and we actually speak to them into their life, the love of Jesus, what, you know, how much Jesus loved them, and we talk to them about you guys. So a partnership like this has been, like you guys are on the ground, helping us, supporting us, sending us people, sending us resources, prayers, like your, your prayer warriors for the nest. 
and we couldn't do it without those prayers. We had a meeting just now with, you know, you guys and our team. They continue speaking about how much they understand the sacrifice you guys are making by leaving your phones, your comfort, your life to come here to minister to them. You know, nobody has ever served them. You know, mm. they have been forgotten, abandoned, you know, like they don't exist. So for them to see a group of women and men to leave their, their houses and their homes to come here, to wash their dishes, to speak to them, to come and work with their children, to receive the woman and tell them that they're loved and seen and, and protected by God. You know, it's, um, they, see, they feel seen and heard almost for the first time in their life. So it's, that is just one of the many, many, many benefits. You know, um, they love to know about you guys, to know about your testimonies. They see that, you're, that there's so many differences between them, their story, and your story as women, a mom, and a grandma. So, you know, I can again go on and on and on. Uh, it's countless. Hi, I'm Kenny Humphreys. This is my wife, Lauren Humphreys. And we're from Round Rock, Texas, and placed with Send International in Anchorage, Alaska. Every summer, City View sends a mission trip. I think we've had, what, three? Yeah. Three so you have gold member status. And it's fantastic. Our people feel really, really supported. And with it, we are able to share the love of Christ to our neighbors in ways that we aren't able to share the rest of the year. It's been a huge thing for me because I often feel very alone up here and I struggle um, to feel like other people are um, caring about the people that we are putting so much effort into. Um, and when the team comes, like, every year, <laughs> I cry. Because it's just about, um, so amazing to feel supported and feel like other people care about the work that's being done and care about the families that we meet and the things that are um, happening. And just having that support from City View makes such a difference for me uh, in my daily work and in the things that we're able to do. I really do feel like City View's partnered with us in our ministry. And in addition to being our sending church and sending us out, I feel like I can lean on City View when I need a partner. When we were first sent from City View, um, we came up front and they prayed for us. And that has been um, something that has been special to me the whole time, that they continue to pray for us. Like individuals pray for us. I know the church and I know that the prayer team prays for us. And when we post things that we need prayer for, City View is the people that respond and they're um, telling us, so they're praying for us and checking in on us and that makes such a difference to me. Specifically, I think we have a lot of stories about how Lauren will tell people that there are people from Texas praying for them. And it like, I don't know, it does something to them. They get really excited to know the people. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask them if I can um, ask our friends in Texas who are, I call them our prayer group. Um, to pray for uh, for those specific people, and they say yes, and a lot of times they cry. City View members have actually um, sponsored certain families for us. We've had people um, send food to some of our families that had no food. Um, we've had them help support uh, mom to be able to see her daughter by uh, flying her from a faraway village with no road in to be able to see her daughter who was sick. Um, so we've had them you know, sponsor and help out our families in those ways, as well as uh, help support us financially, monthly, and in different specific uh, projects that we've worked on. Yeah, I think the financial support's been amazing. Uh, we definitely could not do it without City View. Absolutely, absolutely could not do anything that we're doing without, without City View's support. You guys have been absolutely fantastic. I think the way that um, City View supports us both financially and prayer support and just people checking in on us and being a part of our team um, means everything to me. And that's how we are able to keep going, I think, is just knowing that we're not alone in this. Hey, amazingly enough, I wrote the sermon before I heard that video. But yet, you guys have done such a good job that they're able to testify to what you're doing, just like we read in so many of these passages today. But not all of us. And that's where I, I really want to encourage you. Do not leave today without taking that picture of that QR code 
and partnering with one of our ministry partners. Some of them are out there. If you want to meet them, the Sassies just happen to be in town. They're here. You can see them. Uh, some of our other partners are out there. They'll be happy to tell you about the ministry. There's people there that can represent ministries. The ones that aren't on the website, I can tell you about. So really encourage you to partner with somebody before you leave or at least get and choose this week partners that you can partner with and then begin to be a missional Christian as part of a mission-minded church. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you that you are a God who sins, that you sent your son to us, and now you send us out into the world. Help us to be mission-minded Christians that, Lord, understand culture, that we can effectively minister for you. In Jesus' name.